morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Dawn Evans from Sourcing Interest Group, and I'm so pleased to welcome you back to our first webinar of 2015. So with that, I'm really excited because we have with us today Brian Jacobs and Michelle Flynn. And if you know anything about this topic, a case study, how effective risk management drives global supply chain optimization, if you talk about that subject, you probably already know about Brian and Michelle. Brian is the International Director of Corporate Solutions at JLL. As a principal at Corporate Solution, he focuses on complex real estate outsourcing contracts. He has led the JLL executive team in many successful new outsourcing programs for Fortune 500 clients, and has served as the chairman of JLL Global Business Development Group. His specialties include outsourcing, business development, B2B complex sales, recruiting and leadership, facilities management, and corporate real estate. And with him today is Michelle Flynn. Now, Michelle is a, a very well-known consultant in her earlier days, but she also is the founder and vice chairman of Hyperos. She's an industry visionary, without a doubt, and subject matter expert that I send people to all year long to get advice. As a founder of Hyperos, she's developed the industry-leading platform for managing third parties globally. She's also the founder of Expense Management Solutions and was instrumental in developing performance-based contracting for global outsourcing relationships in the field of corporate real estate and administrative services. A very frequent speaker, we ask her every single summit to speak, standing room only whenever she is in the room. And so, like I said, they have Hyperos today has brought us two of the most outstanding speakers from JLL and Hyperos together today. So with that, I want to welcome the two of you and tell you thank you so much. I'm excited to hear you guys speak. Great. Thanks, Don. I really appreciate it. Um, I know we're both excited to be here today and, and to talk with the membership about risk management and third-party management and, and what's going on. I'm actually going to start. We'll do a, a quick overview of context for the industry, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brian. And Brian's going to really be talking about how JLL is, has made some uh, changes in how they're delivering their services to their clients around the area of third-party management. And I would encourage everyone to please feel free to post those questions and answers as Dawn noted. Uh, Brian and I will, Dawn will pop in with the questions at an appropriate time. And if we don't get to them, I know he and I would be more than happy to respond via email after the fact. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And just very quickly introduce for those of you who are not familiar with Hyperos. As Dawn noted, it is a third-party management software platform. It is the largest platform in the world today. Um, the, one of the unique things about the software is it was actually purpose-built to satisfy the need of clients, organizations who need to manage their third parties. And we'll talk a lot about why that came about. It actually stemmed from the consulting work that I had done for quite a few years with a lot of the outsourcing arrangements, many of which I actually did with Brian. Um, and the need for customers and service providers to work together effectively to make sure that they're satisfying the regulatory needs of their clients, that they're being successful in their performance, and, and how best to do that. So you'll see some very few of the clients off on the right-hand side just to give you a sense of it. It's designed to satisfy some of the largest organizations in the world. And it's really all about how do you protect your value of your relationships, how do you control those risks, and how do you optimize the resources on a go-forward basis. Brian, you want to just take a minute or two and introduce JLL? Sure. Uh, thanks, Michelle. So JLL, or as uh, we were formerly known as Jones Lang LaSalle, is a large real estate uh, facility management, uh, construction management company. Uh, we're global um, in uh, every region of the world in um, uh, uh, different countries. We have 5,200, uh, 52,000 employees um, around the world. And we manage, as part of our outsourcing business, um, over 50,000 suppliers. So that, that on, in total, we have over two, uh, 26 billion of spend. And that's across our facility and property management businesses and construction management. So third-party risk and management has evolved over time. And we'll talk in a few minutes about how we've seen that evolve as our business has grown. But we've needed tools and to bring a more sophisticated way to manage uh, all of these activities around the world in these different geographies on behalf of our clients. Great. Thanks, Brian. So let's just go ahead and get started and talk. Hold on, if I can make the slide move forward. There we go. Uh, about context. For years, 10 decades, 
companies have been using third parties to assist them in delivering their services. A lot has changed, though. In the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a massive increase. Many people call it outsourcing. Outsourcing is really just another word for sourcing. It just means that instead of buying a particular product, you're actually enabling an organization to deliver services on your behalf. So it's not just buying of the raw goods and materials, it's actually potentially outsourcing full entire business processes. There's been a lot of research done in the last few years, and what you'll find is that today most organizations will tell you that there's no longer their four walls within which they operate, that that fourth wall is gone. As a matter of fact, over 60% of revenue for most corporations is delivered on their behalf by actions taken by third parties with whom they're doing business. If you talk to some of the major manufacturers, you'll actually go out on their websites and you'll see that 90 to 95% of their revenue is derived as a result of actions taken on their behalf or products provided by third parties. So the massive increase in the amount of third party relationships that are happening out there in the industry has been one of the core drivers. It's been really critical when you think about the fact that today organizations and for years have had human resource platforms to manage their onboarding, to manage their talent retention, to manage performance. And it's not that the HR department is worried about managing the employees themselves. It's providing the technology, the platform, the processes, and the procedures to enable the actual managers to manage the employees. Well, if somewhere between in excess of 60% of the revenue is now actually being generated as a result of performance by people who are not your employees, when you stop and think about how do you actually go about and do all of those things that you need to do in order to manage those third parties in the same way that you would effectively manage your employees, you realize there's been some major gaps. So that's one piece of the equation. Another piece of the equation is the huge increase in regulatory pressures. And you see just some of the regulatory agencies off to the right of the slide, whether it's the, the new organizations such as the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that didn't even exist five years ago, or it's the increase in the regulatory agencies who are now enforcing regulations that have been in place for years and years and years, but now people are paying far more attention to it. You look at the increasing worldwide domestic enforcement of the bribery and anti-corruption and compliance issues that are out there. People are now holding the primary or the prime, such as the organization who uh, is doing business, responsible for the actions of their suppliers. Some of the interesting facts out there are 90% of the fines that the DOJ and the SEC uh, apply to organizations as a result of uh, anti-bribery and anti-corruption scandals are actually as a result of actions taken on their behalf by one of their third parties, not actions that the corporation itself is responsible for. So you've got increasing number of outsourced providers, increasing amounts of uh, regulatory pressure, increasing enforcement, but you've also got the pace of change. It's so rapid, everything is much more global. The types of services that people are putting out are far more core to the business that they're doing. And what that means is that organizations have a driving need to see on a much more transparent basis what's happening not just at their first level of sourcing, but within their entire supply chain down to the lowest factor. They need to know who's doing what to whom for what reason and why so that they can report effectively on that and manage and mitigate those risks to the point that in many instances the board is extremely involved, and particularly within the financial services industry, there's new regulations out over the last year that really mandate the board level of involvement. So when you think about it, global realities, increasing regulations, ongoing due diligence, not enough anymore, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And as you think about the exposures and what the challenge is, the reality is, is that you have not just the regulatory forces that I've been talking about, but the business perspective as well, right? So your third parties that you have to think about, they're not just your vendors, they're not just your subcontractors. It could be your resellers, it could be people on the revenue side of your business, it can be your distribution partners. Um, it's, it's much more about anybody actually in some of the regulatory agencies, they define third parties as anyone with whom you're doing business who is not a customer. And if you stop and think about that, for those of us who have historically been in the sourcing, the world of sourcing, our focus has been primarily upon those vendors with whom we either cut a purchase order or possibly wrote a contract. You go into the financial services industry, a correspondent bank would historically never have been considered 
truly a vendor. They're much more of a partner, and yet today they fall within that third-party category that you need to be able to manage effectively. So when you think about it, and you think about that life cycle of a third party, you need to recognize that for most Fortune 1,000 companies today, there's somewhere between 20 and 40,000 companies with whom they're doing business in some form or fashion. As Brian mentioned, JLL's number is closer to 50,000. The one final point I want to make from a context perspective is to encourage people to recognize that for years, especially those of us in the sourcing business, knew you had to do effective due diligence before you chose to do business with a third party. And that was typically something we all did very, very well. The reality is, and Brian will talk more about this in a few minutes as he, as he goes through his, his presentation, is it's no longer just enough to make sure that you do your effective due diligence. Rapid pace of change in the industry today means that something that you might have checked out a month ago or six months ago when you hired that third party might come back to bite you. And a perfect example of this is if you think about the fact that you're running, for example, an OFAC check for the Office of Foreign Affairs, I can't remember exactly what it's called, where you're supposed to make sure that they're not uh, in violation of any rules and that you're allowed to be able to do business with these people before the Russia sanctions you might have run a check on a, on a vendor and they would have been fine with the new sanctions imposed on Russia with the changes in Ukraine. Somebody with whom you might have been doing business with for years may now be on the disbarred list. So as you think about it, it's about the life cycle. It's about how do I manage, how do I assess, manage, and measure the risk for myself or my clients in a way that takes me from the beginning, the onboarding process, all the way through the life cycle of that relationship that I have with that third party. And the bottom part of the slide is really just to identify for you some of the things that we see in our business. These are the kinds of things that we see the clients using, uh, managing their third parties, thinking about things like any bribery, any corruption, any money laundering, information privacy and security, what do we deal with new supplier onboarding, subcontractor compliance, contract management. Those are the biggies, but the others there are things we see folks worried about every single day. So with that, what I'd like to do now is pass the ball to Brian and have him uh, go ahead and uh, begin his discussion. So um, as Michelle was mentioning, we've seen an evolution within our business. And just to put into context what JLL does and um, our strategy, you know, our our goal to get to 2020 is that we're investing and focusing on be, being the first in corporate real estate services and outsourcing solutions in the tower of services that we provide. Um, part of that goal, you know, we've identified nine strategic priorities, and two of those relate to supplier management. Uh, we have risk management and operational efficiency are two areas that we have work streams focusing on managing activities in those areas because we know that that's critical to us achieving that uh, 2020 strategy. Um, we, uh, to the right side of uh, this screen, we have what we uh, we provide to our clients, which is really what we call our real estate life cycle, um, uh, and it's the three areas of corporate real estate costs. So those of you in the sourcing community uh, deal with this all the time when you're looking at the spend analysis, but real estate costs will fall into rent, operating expenses, and capital. If for, in our business, all three of those areas involve third parties and third party risk. Uh, in every case, that spend is being managed on behalf of a client, but you have third parties, whether they're vendors, uh, construction contractors, subcontractors, sub, uh, material suppliers, or landlords, you know, providing these services and you're paying for them. So as the industry has evolved and um, through our supply chain and as the things have developed, we've seen that uh, we needed a more involved way to manage the, the third party risk. So. Um, the, you know, actually, I'm having trouble advancing the slides. So, Michelle, I'm going to pass the um, it back to you, and if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Okay, let me just give me one second. There we go. Perfect. So, to put this into historical, the historic context. Um, as Michelle mentioned, the industry's evolved significantly. And when I started with Jones Lang LaSalle um, uh, 15 years ago, all of our contracts 
um, were in an agency basis. We didn't contract on a principal basis uh, for any of these services. So the risk remained with the uh, company that um, was hiring us. And we really grew up out of third-party property management where we would perform a fee for service, we provide the bodies, but the actual activity, the risk would remain with the uh, the owner. As the as outsourcing began on the corporate side and as it began to evolve, it starts to look more like other outsourcing contracts and other other sectors and other sourcing contracts. And the, the uh, we've moved to a situation where we now act as principal in over 90% of our agreements. So that means that we assume the risk uh, for these activities. And with that shift, we need um, the risk is transferred from our clients um, uh, to us. Uh, the regulatory and compliance requirements that uh, Michelle was describing, as they've developed over the last several years, have become our, uh, you know, our problem to oversee. We still need uh, to provide to our clients transparency, uh, we, and we're also seeing an evolution where we're contracting more and more for outcomes. We're guaranteeing the financial results and the service level results um, and the compliance results in many cases for our clients. So as we're managing the entire process, that entire life cycle from end to end, um, we've needed a, a more sophisticated way to, to get to, um, it, it, to do our business. And the next uh, page, what we'll show is that you know, we've we've laid thought through, and those as part of our strategy, what we call getting safely to 2020, and it involves really focusing on first and foremost as part of our values, we focus on being one of the most ethical companies, the most ethical company in the real estate services sector. Uh, we've been recognized by third parties for that. We've uh, been given awards, and it's something that's very important to who we are. But then also, you know. In order to make money, to improve our margins, to return, uh, uh, provide a, a good return to our shareholders, we have to have a you know, framework. And due diligence has always been something that you do, even back in the agency um, contracting world. You, uh, a, a property manager, a facility manager, would always conduct due diligence and you know, perform a history review. The governance process um, and the contractual management, however, lead into a more complex world. And as the business has expanded geometrically around the world and has grown at a, at a rapid pace, we've had we've needed to uh, it's become more sophisticated, invest more in supplier management, uh, both people and process and tools to get that work completed. So. Hyperos was, is part of a suite of technology products that we've selected you know, to manage our entire business. Um, Hyperos will be our new supplier management portal where we will ask the suppliers to interact with Jones Lang LaSalle via technology, automating the process. Uh, we're going to eliminate the manual process of registering, of um, us having to onboard the vendor, chase down the information. Uh, one of the problems um, is that we may have a supplier who w works for multiple clients, but the client may have different insurance requirements, different, um, they may be in different jurisdictions with different licensing requirements, there may be different codes of conduct that affect the same supplier. So Hyperos is going to help us automate all of those things and manage in real time rather than looking at a historical rearview mirror look and what the problems might be, where the gaps are, so that we can work with our suppliers to make sure that they and JLO remain compliant for what we're delivering for the end for our, our corporate client. It, but really, on the next slide, this isn't all about you know, just compliance um, and outcomes. You, we see this as a way of improving our margins. I mentioned that we're being asked to, to sign guaranteed contracts, guarantee outcomes. So the performance of the, the supplier, our supply chain, and uh, both financial and uh, providing levels of service, we need tools to be able to allow our people to manage across a large geography, manage an increasingly uh, complex landscape. And so by providing, having business intelligence, providing transparency, uh, we, uh, we see this as improving our productivity and our margins rather than just being a compliance uh, program. It's also uh, core to maintaining our reputation because our reputation is really uh, something that we, as I mentioned, we maintain uh, a serious focus on because be, being one of a, a, an ethical company that works globally, that works sustainably, um, 
in a way that uh, uh, is with proper business practices is something that you once you lose that reputation, it's very difficult to get back. And uh, we see a tool like Hyperos allowing us to maintain that and, and keep that. Yeah, so, Brian, so, I think um, <laughs> I think you've gone very, very quickly through uh, through the slides, and we, we have actually almost a, a good 30 minutes left in, in the hour to, to work with. So what I'd love to do now is just sort of um, – have a conversation a little bit more about um, what you're doing and why you're doing, because it's really not, the, the webinar today really isn't about Hyperos as a platform, but more about how Jones Lang LaSalle is, is really interacting right. with your clients. And one of the one of the things that is of such interest to me, and I know has is, is been a big question for a number of people, is you've obviously, as we looked at some of the, the previous slides before, you had ways that you were doing all of these things before. It wasn't that these were new things that you're just beginning to do, but they're things that you're now beginning to do in a way that enables you to do them um, so that everybody can see it in a single place. And I know as uh, one of the board members is responsible for the whole entire delivery system for JLL globally, there were a number of, of critical issues that you were attempting to solve for your clients as you thought about um, how did you change your processes and how did you really begin to emphasize your third-party management what are some of the things that, and I know you respond to a lot of RFPs for your clients, what are some of the real core drivers that you're seeing your clients look for from you today versus three or four or five years ago? Well, I mentioned the financial um, guarantees. Your clients are needing us to you know, commit to a certain um, financial glide path. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that, by moving slowly, you know, we've had to move faster. The clients don't want us to come in, um, roll up all, onboard all of the vendors, and move to a transition where they can start to see the financial benefits uh, 18 to 24 months down the road. They're looking for you know, faster, quicker wins. So automating that process of mo transitioning vendors over while not disrupting the service level, services is something that we needed to focus on. So finding a way to automate that process was necessary. Our clients are also asking for business intelligence, for not rearview mirror um, reporting, but forward-looking reporting, uh, predictive uh, intelligence. And so we needed to get our um, our entire, all of our data, not just supplier data, but all the data that we touch into a framework that we can start to apply algorithms to, um, hire data scientists to look at, which we've under, undertaken that activity, so that we can begin to look at predictive analytics of what is going to happen to a real estate portfolio and to uh, the spend around a uh, facilities portfolio to really enable the productivity for the the client. So that's those are some of the things that have evolved, and we've just needed to invest in the tools and and also the people that can manage at that level, um, rather than having isolated accounts and isolated building managers um, managing them, you know, from a with a central you know common framework. So that's a great segue, Brian. So I know that because of my familiarity with the real estate industry, I'm very I'm very aware of how you guys currently service your client base in the sense that effectively every customer that you do business with, you have a portfolio or a team that manages that portfolio on their behalf, and you've been onboarding folks team by team or customer by customer. Talk for just a minute about, I know that one of the big differences, as you've mentioned, is some clients have different expectations, but there's also a different level of expectation is they're not based on the types of risk that that particular supplier would expose any of your clients to. You know, I know that was a big portion of why you were looking to, to automate and how you've been changing your practices to ensure that you do the right level of risk management based on the kind of service that a vendor is doing. Can you talk That's about right. That? Sure. Uh, different vendors will, you know, even the same vendor will do a different level of service uh, depending on what uh, is needed. Um, and different types of vendors are going to you know, introduce different risk. Um, so if it's a construction management uh, uh, company, um, you, you may and 
and you have a certain t uh, contract structure where speed to market is important, they may be introducing different types of risk uh, by you know, moving quickly, uh, but you have safety uh, requirements that you need to comply with. We have uh, legal re and legal and regulatory requirements in every market that we're doing that work, as an example, even though we may be hiring a contractor to do it. They may be doing the same work across the street, same jurisdiction, but have a different t contract structure, and they may be, it may be a different uh, outcome that we've contracted for and a different level of, of uh, compliance that we're needing to manage to. Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did very well. And I think, you know, a good example, you and I have talked about this a number of times with the number of security penetrations and, and the, the huge exposure. For, I'm, I'm sure most folks know this by this time, but the example, for example, of Target, where they actually lost a lot of credit card data, actually stemmed from an HVAC provider. And I know that many of the organizations out there today if they're doing their risk assessment based on spend, would suggest that a supplier that they pay less than $100,000 a year to to manage their HGAC contract, which in many cases would actually be a subcontractor of a prime such as JLL, they would not necessarily have done a full risk value assessment on them because they didn't spend so much money with them. But in this case, and is often the case, that's a contractor that actually had access to the network and it was through that contractor's access to the network that the um, the villains, if you want to call them that, were actually able to get access to that network because in, there was not a good risk assessment done and it wasn't identified that that particular contractor would have access to the network and therefore there were no uh, mitigating risk measures taken with that HVAC contractor about their log on connectivity. So, I mean, that's a good example in my mind, and I'm sure you can think of other examples. Whether it's not always about um, it's not always about physical security, or it's not always about spend. It's often about what level of access are they going to have to your customer, either physical access or information access to their networks. Is that fair? That's right. Um, Could I interrupt with a question that came in um, for you, and, it's, and, I, and I think I understand. It. And it says, "Do you have?" A JL team managing Hyperos for you, and if so, how many do you do you have managing that program? We have a, pro a small project team that's working with Hyperos, but our plan is to have Hyperos be a tool that our property managers and facility managers and uh, project managers use, um, you know, as they're delivering services. So we. Um, Michelle, our team is about four or five people, I think, that are just um, – but it's our IT team that's working on the implementation. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a better – so JLL is in implementation right now. They're actually – you've just gone into production this month, as a matter of fact, I think. Um, so that's probably a tough question for Brian to answer, but I can certainly answer the question relative to the norm. So uh, mm -hmm. once the implementation is complete, generally speaking, most of our clients – have a system administrator who's a part-time person, um, often in the IT side or sometimes on the business side but with an IT bent. Um, and then in terms of the number of people that interact with the platform, it's all over the map, right? So typically if you look at the slide that's up right now, you'll see there's a lot of different areas that benefit from the platform, whether that's the legal team because they're doing the OFAC checks or they're managing the antivirus and corruption through it, the risk management team because they're doing uh, certificate of insurance tracking, possibly the procurement team who's responsible for diversity management, um, you know, business continuity, IT. So typically what we see is that there are, I, I would call it arms and legs and ears and eyes kind of thing. There's typically a number of subject matter experts who are responsible for managing the uh, content of the compliance questionnaires and ensuring that the IT expert has blessed the privacy or the uh, IT security review and the, the legal team has blessed the privacy review. So there's a lot of people that have roles to play. And as Brian said, his users are going to be the on-site on property managers who are responsible for managing the actual third parties on behalf of their clients. And that, of course, is just the typical end user. Um, but typically from a system administration perspective, we see – less than one, and from a general overview, management depends. I know um, John Stevens was on record at a previous SIG conference that said that he was managing their team at Microsoft 
globally managing over 100,000 third parties had four uh, individuals involved in sort of managing the system. And keep in mind that they're doing all of their onboarding for 96 countries around the world through the platform, as well as lots of compliance management lots of performance management. So it depends on how broadly you're using the platform in terms of what it will take. And, you know, Michelle, two questions just came through um, that I think are, are related. Um, Keith Arthur uh, from AT&T, who, um, hi, Keith. Uh, he, he's, uh, um, we've done work with you before. He's asking, will we stop using uh, 360 facility and go to Hyperos? And actually, it's a great question. 360 facility is our CMMS asset management system, so it's how we track the work that's being performed in a building. Um, Hyperos is a different system and provides different functionality, um, and so we won't be replacing 360 facility. It's actually we're enhancing our investment in 360 because it's doing other things uh, for us um, than Hyperos. But Michelle, maybe since you developed Hy um, Hyperos, you can talk about how it's different a little bit from, like, say, a CMMS system that we uh, were using. and the related question that I'll answer just quickly is, is JLL using another system that uh, before the Hyperos were replaced? Actually, we saw it as a gap. We had an accounting system, a procurement system, and a, a CMMS system, computerized maintenance management system. But there was a gap for this vendor portal that didn't exist in any of the systems, which is why we've elected to also add Hyperos to supplement what we're doing with those other tools. Yeah. So from my perspective, Brian, the best way to, to think about how a CMMS tool, which is what Facility 360 is in Hyperos Interact is, and actually with many other systems. So 360 Facility today was is one of those systems that JLL would have had to key in supplier information to. So they were maintaining supplier, they were onboarding suppliers into their ERP solutions, their, their purchasing solution, and their CMMS solution. And in place now, what they will be doing is they'll do all the onboarding in Hyperos, and Hyperos will be feeding JLL's data warehouse, which will then push all of the supplier data down to those three other systems, the ERP, the procurement, and the CMMS system. So it didn't replace any of them, but what it did is it, it eliminated the need for literally hundreds of JLL people, either at the location level, at the regional level, or at the national level, to be maintaining and updating supplier information in the multiple systems, and it, it enables them to drive and main, have the suppliers themselves maintain and update all their critical information and have it automatically pushed down to all the supporting systems so that you can be sure that all of your supporting systems at all times are up-to-date and accurate and connected. The other thing that they'll be doing is um, one of the benefits of having the platform, as Brian said, we fill a lot of the gaps that an ERP or accounting solution, a procurement solution, and a CMMS don't. Most of those systems actually don't manage risk at all. They don't really measure compliance at all. They pay the bills, they place an order, or they issue a work order. Um, what what Hyperos will also, the role they will, we will be playing for JLL on a go-forward basis is if, for example, a certificate of insurance has not been updated, it will be able to actually place a hold to that supplier, they won't get paid and they won't get any new work orders issued for the CMMS system until they update the certificate of insurance, which will enable JLL to manage risk and to ensure that their clients are protected against things like an insurance certificate expiring and a subcontractor showing up on property, having an accident, and then going back against that subcontractor and not being able to connect or collect. That's right. So, it, and it also gives us an advantage of, uh, we feel, of being able to move quickly and onboarding all those activities um, so that we can move, um, you know, a, an organization that's managing the properties in a different way over to the JLL platform, being able to, to do all those things. Uh, not, not only is it risk management, but it's also a speed to market approach. So I have a couple of the questions that came in. And one is, that, and I, I think this might be as much for you, Michelle, but are, are the predictive intelligence or predictive analytics that you have built into the system, are they used within the vendor selection process? And if so, how, how is that used? So, Brian, you want to answer for JLL, and then I'll give you an answer broader. Um, at, at this time, we, we, have, um, we, we use other tools to subscribe and uh, track vendor um, 
you know, financial information, you know, historically um, looking back, we haven't really started to look at predictive analytics yet around vendor selection. Um, certainly something that has uh, that I've been, I'm guessing the industry will evolve toward, and we'll probably be investing in, you know, putting, you know, buying that technology. But we haven't developed predictive analytics around vendor selection on, on our side yet. Right. So I think that's part of your future, your future mapping, Brian. Exactly. So for example, and quite a few of our clients actually feed all, whether they're getting data from an outside source such as a Thomson Reuters or a Dow Jones or a Dun and Bradstreet, they'll feed that information. Um, back into the platform because it, the platform is capable of pulling information from any source that you want it to. Um, and we do see quite a few of our clients actually, as they're looking at various things, whether it's a credit rating, which unfortunately we all know the, that some of the information is a little bit old before you see it, but if you're tracking negative news, for example, through a Thomson Reuters or Steele or one of the other providers, um, you do have clients now saying, okay, um, building a workflow where it says, okay, if my credit rating for this company drops by, you know, A percent or drops from double A to, to single A or single A to B, um, I want a, a warning flag to go out and I want to launch a, a new um, financial viability questionnaire out to the client, out to the supplier to say, hey, tell me what's going on. So we do have a lot of clients who are using the information and using the platform as their central source of data relative to everything that's happening with a third party and using the information that comes in to actually one of the best things is called actionable intelligence, which where it actually triggers the next thing that comes through. And a really good example of that is, is the anti-bribery, anti-corruption stuff. So a lot of our clients are running the OFAC checks through the platform. They do have to connect, connect out to one of the data providers to get that information. We don't sell data, but we do enable you to, to pull the data in the platform then says, oh, okay, these guys are on the OFAC list, and it immediately triggers a program that goes out to the vendor manager that says, well, stop, you have a problem here. Or maybe it says, okay, we didn't, they're not on the OFAC list, but because of the risk assessment that you did, we know that they could potentially expose you to any bribery, any corruption, because perhaps they're working on your behalf. Brian talked a little bit about construction. Um, we all know Walmart got into a lot of trouble in Mexico because one of their subcontractors was bribing the local official to give them certificates of occupancy. Um, in that particular instance, the system in the risk assessment would have known that that particular supplier was, con was working with a local government and therefore would have identified that there are potential exposure for any bribery, any corruption. Uh, Microsoft, as an example, uses the system to say, oh, if you have the exposure to a government on our behalf, then you have to take the training. The system delivers the training. So whether it's predictive analytics or workflow that drives directly into um, actions, what it really does is it allows you to automate that and take the subjectivity out of the individual vendor managing know, knowing, manager knowing what they need to do and when they need to do it. So I'm not sure if that okay. answered that question, but hopefully it did. Hopefully That's right. It did. And we're, we're, um, another one. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say we are using Dun & Bradstreet for that data. Um, we don't have predictive, and it's flagging things, the predictive forward-looking you know, things that you were talking about. We haven't yet, yet developed. We are de working on some of those in a future state, but that's that's how I interpreted the question. Sorry. Then another question says, how often are those requirements being reviewed by your clients after they've been set? Oftentimes, the nature of work changes, and the initial risk assessment set doesn't reflect what is appropriate given the current date. So it's a really good question. How often should you update that? Well, I'll talk about how it works for um, how I see my clients uh, doing it, and then I'll ask Michelle to talk about um, it gener more broadly how she, she sees it. But you know, our clients are usually updating requirements. You know, first of all, as needed, as you know, legislation changes or as you know, there's a requirement. But usually, our contracts are structured so that they can be flexible, and the client can update. We have quarterly reviews, but you know, things are updated. Um, you know, and you know, service requirements can be updated. You know, based on business needs, but annually um, is usually the right cadence. But some of these things are so far so distributed that you know there, there may not be the return on investment to review um, you know, 
so often. You know, it's, it, you need to just update as requirements change or um, as you know, your business needs change, but you want to put them on autopilot. Others that are more critical, you may want to re review on a more criti uh, re routine basis. Yeah, so I'll answer that question actually three separate ways. So, so one thing is that you know requirements changing. So as I mentioned, typically there are subject matter experts that own the compliance programs themselves and decide what questions get asked, and they also define the periodicity of when the when the questionnaires are submitted and when they actually happen. Right. So I would say, as Brian said, if for example it's the information security privacy officer, that officer is generally expected to validate the compliance questions and the program and how often does it happen and what's the flow annually unless there's a regulatory change that requires them to update it more often. That's one way. We see um, the, the second thing is the processing or the periodicity of how frequently different things happen. And what we see is often our clients are setting the periodicity based on the level of risk. So if it's a very high risk relationship um, where they're particularly concerned, for example, about the financial viability of the player, they may require that the financial viability questionnaire be automatically issued quarterly. Um, if it's a much lower risk relationship and very easy to switch to a new provider, best example, something like that might be your office supply provider, typically they will only request the financial viability questionnaire compliance be done on an annual basis. Um, I think if, if the question is more about um, how often do you check for a particular supplier, what we see as best practice today is that any time there is a new SOW, it has to get risk assessed, that particular, because when you think about it, use IBM as an example. IBM historically has been a provider of hardware. Um, they've been a provider of software, and they are a provider of services. So if you hire IBM because you're, they're supplying you laptops, there's not a whole lot of risk that you need to worry about there. But if they're managing your data center, there is. And I think historically, companies went through a process where they approved at the, at the vendor level and said, okay, IBM is an approved vendor. We can award them any kind of business we want. Today, what clients are doing is they're issuing a risk assessment. They're running up the SOW or the statement of work or whatever it is. Uh, they're risk assessing at that level so that if there's an amendment to the contract, that involves them doing different services, and as a result of those different services, you realize you now have additional risk mitigation or compliance things you need to do, the system will automatically do that. But it's up to the individual customer to determine, you know, if you're, you really need to be doing it at the relationship or the SOW level in order to stay on top of it. So not sure which of those three questions you were asking, but hopefully that answers it. <laughs> All right, so this one is very interesting, and it says, can Hyperos act as a delivery vehicle to disseminate training materials and seminars to vendors on code of conduct, FCPA, et cetera? If so, can access by vendors be monitored for completion? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We do have a very um, effective training module. We actually did develop it to help satisfy one of the global clients who needed to satisfy a DOJ consent order. Um, and absolutely, it can help you identify who within your third-party base even needs to be trained. It can provide training to the individuals. And one of the interesting things is most, uh, most organizations think, well, I can use my learning management system to do that. The problem with most LMS systems today is the way they identify who the trainees are comes from HR, and HR only has your employees. So once people started to realize that problem, they came to us and said, okay, well, you know who our vendors are. Um, is there a way you can help us train the individuals? Because you can't really just train a company, you have to train people. Um, so the training module is actually designed to enable you not only to deliver training to a company, but to, directly to the individuals assigned to the account. And yes, you can absolutely track at that level who took what course, when did they complete it, and bring it all back. There's a, there's a reporting capability that enables you to track all that and allow your, your supplier actually to see who within their organization has taken and hasn't taken the training and who passed and who didn't. Very good. So, Brian, one of so the folks, things... So, we have just a few more minutes for questions to come in. So, I have a, just a couple more in queue. But other than that, if you have questions, make sure to send them in because if we don't get to them today, we'll make sure that the presenters get them and can follow up with you. So, go ahead, Michelle. So, I was just going to say, Brian, on this one, you on the slide that's up, you talked a lot about, you know, the onboarding and the compliance, but not a lot about performance management. Um, 
I know that for many of our clients today, they're using performance management as one of those predictors of potential problems going forward. And I know this is a part of your vision. Do you want to spend just a few minutes and talk about why you think performance management is so key to the third-party risk? Sure. I mean, the, the, understanding how if they're able to um, – achieve their KPIs if they're, you know, looking at how a vendor, if a vendor is going to, um, you know, uh, have financial problems or um, you, you can see looking back at their performance, you know, predict if there's going to be an issue. And so you capturing the performance using the balance scorecard measurements and vendor management measurements through Hyperos will allow us to get there. We've We've used different tools, including Hyperos, for some of our clients over the years um, in managing our performance against SLAs and against um, you know, the contractual obligations that we have, and then we've asked our subcontractors to do the same. But it's a way that you can mitigate risk, but also you know, ensure that you're getting paid properly and prove to the client that, you've actually, that JLL and um, you know, the, the vendor have done what we've signed up to do. Did that, yeah. did that answer your question? Yeah, and I think one of the things we're seeing a lot, too, is that somebody asked a question earlier about how are you using this to, to contribute to your future sourcing decisions. We're seeing people use their compliance metrics, their risk metrics, and their performance management scores as contrib contributors to a decision, do they award that supplier more business or not, so that if a supplier is either underperforming or has been noncompliant or has too high a, a residual risk factor on their score, they stop them from being awarded additional business until they clean up their act with their current business. So that is one of the ways we're seeing performance management be used to drive you know, future sourcing decisions. So, Don, did you want to ask one more question before I sort of close it off? Yes. So I think this one is also good. So with Hyperos, they said after implementation, quite often we need a whole system integrator to manage the program. So once Hyperos is actually implemented, is it complete? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, so I would suggest to you that, yeah, once Hyperos, the problem is, is, remember how we talked about the speed of change? The reality is nothing's ever static. And the the beauty of it is is if if nothing changed and the regulations didn't change and you were happy with your workflow and you didn't want to change you know Sally didn't leave and Fred didn't show up and you didn't need to make any changes about who got what yeah once you implement it you don't need to make any changes to it but realistically everything's changing every day a HIP is a great example you know the health insurance protection issue where you need to protect the health data relative to your employees or your customers the HIPAA rules literally change many times a year. So if you're trying to ensure that the appropriate third parties with whom you're doing business are appropriately following the HIPAA regs, somebody's got to go in and tell the system that the HIPAA regs changed and, and modify the content and modify the workflow. So I think, unfortunately, it's too simplistic for me to say it's not really a platform issue. It's not a software issue. It's a you're using the platform as a living entity to manage ever-changing reality. So to suggest that it won't change, no, um, I don't think that's realistic. But it's not a software issue. It's because the world's changing every day. So does that mean that you update? So let's say HIPAA rules change. Are you automatically going out and pulling the new data and having it accessible through the system? Or do people have no. to request certain kinds of data? Yeah, so the client owns content, right? So JLL is responsible for developing their information security privacy questionnaire. Because, and by the way, they're going to have multiple because they have different ones for every one of their clients. So the, the, we are a platform provider. We provide you the ability, the connectivity. We certainly have templates that you're welcome to use. And yes, as regulatory changes happen, we notify our clients that they're happening. We provide templates at times. And we definitely encourage them to make sure that they're staying on top of it. But we're not lawyers. So if a HIPAA rule changes, it's up to you to work with your your healthcare privacy lawyers to see how that change impacts you as an organization, and then you need to do what your lawyers tell you into the platform, not what we tell you. Yeah, we okay. for, uh, just the way we do it, Don, is that we we need we have system administrators that it's not their full time job, but they will update. Um, 
this information as it needs to be updated, and they have other things that they they do when uh, to fill their time when they don't have to. But somebody has to own the database and update it and handle that administration. And like Michelle said, you know, the the input and the content coming from multiple places, you know, because of the complex where we live in. I think mm -hmm. what, the, what the platform okay. can do, Don, in that case is if the HIPAA SME changes the, the questionnaire, the platform, the, the SME can say launch to everybody who's, who's subject to this or only launch on the next time that supplier is, gets it. So the platform enables you to do all of that stuff and provides you all kinds of um, tools to get it done, but the content is really the responsibility of the, the customer. Okay, good. And then how long does it take to get something like this underway and adding value? So that's a great question. I'll let, I'll let Brian talk a little bit about their experience. So what we see is, you know, fast is 90 days, right? If you have a third-party management program in place where you already know what your policy is, you know what your processes are, and you're just trying to automate it, you can make it happen pretty quickly. Um, I think in JLL's case, which is very typical, it was much more of a um, – getting everybody on the same page and thinking about what they need to do and changing their actual underlying policies and procedures and getting buy-in on a global basis before um, actually rolling it out through the platform. That's right. The technology, the technology piece of getting the platform out is the easy part. Um, the, the next difficult piece is really bringing the, um, getting the data loaded in, but by far the hard work is changing the business process, changing the way people are doing the work. And in a distributed environment like JLL, um, it's taken a while. You know, it's taken us a good 12 months of change management, communication, and planning uh, to, to roll this out. Um, but that's because of the complexity of, uh, that I was describing of how large we are. Um, you know, and, but as Michelle said, you can get something going in, uh, in 90 days, get the platform in place, and then it's a matter of how fast you need to move with the data and uh, you know, getting your business uh, on board. Mm -hmm. Good. So that is all the questions I have right now in queue. So do you want to help just wrap it up, Michelle? Yeah, so I think what we really wanted everybody to hear about today was the fact that as you think about third-party management, it really isn't about compliance. It's not just a check-the-box issue. It's, it's about making sure that you have the appropriate business processes and practices in place that drive those results that Brian was talking about, that enable you to deliver transparency to ensure you're successful in, in what it is you're, you're trying to do for your company. And it, we have found that those organizations who make it about compliance don't get the level of support they need and can't drive either the justification for the investment or they end up doing a lot by hand because they can't justify the spend. Um, going back, the second point really speaks to something we just talked about a minute ago, which is flexibility. The reality is the only constant is change. So as you're thinking about how you want to do this and what you want to do, you want to be sure that you have a solution, a program, a policy, a platform that is changing and can change relatively quickly. If you have to hard code all your connections, you're going to find that you're never actually going to be able to launch. So you want to think about that a little bit. As I mentioned, your third parties are not just your suppliers um, or your vendors. It's all everybody that you're doing business with. It's your it's your partners, it's your JVs, it's your distributors, and depending upon what kind of business you're in, it, it, there's all kinds of things you need to be thinking about. So from my perspective, from the automation, it's really, I think the, the thing you want to think about is how can you most consistently execute on what you're trying to do in a way that's auditable? Because today, whether it's your regulators, it's your internal auditors, it's your board, you need to be able to prove that you did what you said you were going to do. And that's really where the automation comes in. Brian, do you want to hit the, the last two bullets? Um, so as I mentioned, the, the data is the, um, you know, isn't really what this is about. You know, it's about getting the data and turning it into forward-looking intelligence that we can act on. And so yeah we're we've invested in Hyperos and all of our technology tools to really start to let us focus on not rearview mirror you know, you know reporting to our clients on what's happened in the portfolio but really trying to anticipate and provide um actionable ideas to um 
to work on, and this is part of uh, enabling us to get there. And then third-party uh, management is, isn't really an option, isn't, isn't something that we can um, you know, just do because it's a nice to have. Our, our, um, our board, our, our chairman, our CFO, our CEO have been very adamant that as we move toward 2020 and as we expand our business, um, especially internationally in uh, you know, developing world, the developing world, we need to have a standardized way of managing um, you know, risk, managing third-party um, activities so that uh, our shareholders aren't at risk and our people aren't at risk. So those uh, those two things you know, re have really driven this the, this discussion. Very good. Well, it is the top of the hour, and folks, we are going to push you the slide deck in the center of your screen in a gray box, and the contact information for both of our presenters is on the thank you slide that you see up in front of you right now. So please keep the conversation going. Brian and Michelle have been presenting at SIG and participating for years, and they are the subject matter experts. So please make sure you reach out to them with any other questions that you have. Remember, this is recorded, and it will be out on our website for the next three years. So you send the link to other folks, and they can still access it. And with that, I want to thank Hyperos, especially you, Michelle, and I want to thank you for bringing Brian to us today, too. I really appreciate it. It was a great webinar. A pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll see both of you in Amelia Island in March, I hope. And folks, That's with right. that, we're going to end today's webinar series. I'm going to see you in Amelia Island March 10th, 11th, and 12th, all three days. Don't, don't come late and don't leave early. You're going to miss something important. And also make sure to register for next week's webinars as well. So with that, I'm signing out, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day or evening. Bye-bye.